This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Tariq Ramadan, who is Professor of Islamic Studies on the Faculty of Theology at Oxford University. He is also President of the European Muslim Network. He has many publications, including In the Foots of the Prophet, Lessons from the Life of Muhammad, The Quest for Meaning, Developing a Philosophy of Pluralism, and his most recent book, What I Believe. Tariq, welcome to Berkeley. Thank you for your invitation. Where were you born and raised? I was born in Geneva, and I was raised there. So I studied all my life. Was the, I, began, I, I studied until in, in the, the PhD in Geneva. And looking back, how do you think your parents uh, uh, shaped your thinking about the world? No, I think it was very important. It's the, this legacy was important because uh, they, they left the country as political uh, in political exile. So and, and, and that country was was Egypt. Egypt yes, yes. Uh, and and everything was about you know the country of origin and and, and dreaming of going back there. Uh, so all this shaped my understanding, and I saw my mother being involved in all this struggle, and my and my father dreaming of going back. And at the same time, having his body in Switzerland and his heart uh, in Egypt. And and your your uh, grandfather. Tell us about your grandfather because he is an important figure in the history of uh, uh, of Egypt. Yes, he's the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood uh, that he uh, founded in the uh, uh, late twenties in twenty. Eight, and uh, uh, he was involved in resisting the British presence and the British colonization, and he was assassinated in, in 49. In fact, he is the father of my mother, but he was the spiritual teacher of my father. So they, they married after he passed away, after he was killed. But uh, uh, he was involved in, in what is known as you know, the first Islamist movement in, in contemporary history. In reading about him, he, he was a really a political activist who created a, a really uh, extraordinary movement and one with, with very great roots both in Egypt and in the Islamic world. Yes, I think that very often the people don't know about him because, you know, 95% of what he uh, wrote and said is still in Arabic. It's not translated. And then, in fact, yes, at the beginning it was resisting the British colonialism and coming back to the Islamic roots. And it was a nonviolent movement, a legalist movement. Uh, afterward, after the repression, after Nasser, Kamal Abdel Nasser became, uh, became the president and, and started this, his repression against them. He was one of them, by the way, but then he started the repression. We had trends that started to be more violent and, 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 and the process of radicalization started afterward. But uh, during the first 20 years when he was the leader of this movement, it was mainly anti-colonization, coming back to the root, and, and as you said, it was everywhere in the, 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 the first the Arab countries and the Muslim majority country. So, so what was it like for you glowing up as a Muslim in Geneva? Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, uh, I assume it was a very cosmopolitan uh, uh, setting, but did you experience discrimination, and, or, or was that not the problem? It was not the problem as it is now, but I experienced uh, uh, it was not easy because, you know, it was the first generation. We were few Muslims in Geneva at that time. The, the great majority of the people who are Muslims in, in Geneva were, you know, international civil servants and, and, and they were coming for a few years. Uh, so um, for years still, uh, I, I was 24, I was thinking of coming back home and for, for me home was Egypt. 
when I started to go back to Egypt, because as we were banned, it's political exile, I, I was unable to go before I was 17. And then I realized that really my culture was a European culture. It was not so much an Egyptian. Of course, the language, the uh, you know, speaking Arabic at home, and and uh, uh, the sense of humor, all this was me. But still, the the roots and and the deep uh, uh, belonging was mainly uh, to Europe and to 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 this other life that I had. So difficult on that uh, in that way but at the same time also uh, the same time the feeling that uh, uh, you know I was perceived as a foreigner an Arab and, and racism was there sometimes not in the way that we are talking today about Islam and this Islamic presence and this Muslim presence which is problematic uh, the, lay out here the, the, the trajectory of your education. You did your undergraduate college work where? In Geneva. In Geneva. Yeah. And what did you? What was your undergraduate major? Uh, I was uh, t uh, uh, studying philosophy and French literature. And then, uh, when did you uh, pursue? I know you did graduate work in philosophy in the West. When did you pursue your Islamic education? You returned to Egypt. Was that after you had your PhD in philosophy? Yes, yes, okay. exactly. I, I went through the whole process and, and the, the PhD was on Nietzsche's philosophy. Okay, let's talk about that for a minute first. So what, so how does, uh, how, how did you uh, come to philosophy? Was it just kind of a, a natural uh, movement because whatever religious studies you were doing or was it no. just the teachers that drew you? No, not at all. I, in fact, you know, I'm the youngest of six and my eldest brothers went to philosophy. So I started to have debates at home, you know, against or with with, with them. And then uh, uh, I was very much interested in, in literature and philosophy and and this was the atmosphere. My father was pushing me to go for law and to be a, a, a lawyer, uh, but I decided to go for philosophy. Uh, and then uh, by reading philosophy, I was very, very interested by the, the Greek philosophy and the, the, you know, the, the, the classical philosophy. And then I, I went through uh, all the process and, and I have a very good teacher, a very good professor at the University of Geneva who was a specialist on Kant. Uh, and the German philosophy. And then I just started to read Nietzsche. And my perception was first he himself was interesting around everything that he was saying about arts and as Heidegger was saying that he's the last metaphysician uh, and the concept of suffering. And then by reading him, I got the impression that he was saying things about other philosophers that was problematic and interesting at the same time. And this is why I went uh, 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 writing on Nietzsche as a historian of philosophy because he, he had this vision. So I had to read both, in fact, the, the philosophers themselves and what he was saying about them and, and to go to uh, a comparative study. And, and as a result of that, you became very well uh, informed about Western philosophy because uh, I I actually uh, read uh, parts of your book which I don't I, I don't think has been published yet in the United States but I'll show it the quest for meaning developing a philosophy of pluralism which I guess will be coming out yeah. soon in the United States so so you really acquired a, a philosopher's sense of the Western tradition Yes, uh, you know, for me it it was important because I, I was uh, born and raised in, in 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 the West, and in fact I understood it as my universe of reference. As much as you know, I was a Muslim, I was also part of this as my culture and as my understanding. So very often the people are surprised by the fact that. Uh, you know, it's it's my world. So so it's as if you know, because I am a Muslim intellectual, I should be the other, not knowing exactly what is the West. In fact, it's not that, it's not this at all. And 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 really, uh, by reading all the philosophers and then to compare what they were saying was what Nietzsche was saying about them. I had to read everything, and I have a, a, a professor, uh, Filenenko, and when he was to start reading a philosopher, he was to read everything. And he pushed me to, 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 to go to, to that direction. So, so I was trying to read as much as possible uh, from all the philosophers, of course. I, 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 I get this, the, 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 the 
the substance of the Western philosophy from within. Uh, I read an interview somewhere with you, and, and I, I believe I recall you're saying that in your study of Nietzsche, you got a sense, uh, in addition to how religious identity is built. Is, is that a, a fair uh, yes. Uh, statement? Yeah. Yes, yes, true. I, I think that uh, uh, um, first, you know, he, he the point for me was really something which is quite important is how do you believe in God or you can you you might believe in God without nurturing the sense of guilt so how do you how do you speak about morality and this universe and, and something which is very important in all the, 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 the Nietzsche's philosophy is the concept of suffering tell me what you do with your suffering I will tell you who you are is it for you something which is an experience that is helping you to go beyond your human capacities or is it is just uh, uh, the, the result of a sense of guilt that you did something which was wrong and he was in tension between this and that and this is why he went from philosophy to arts and the artistic affirmation of the self and I think that all this pushed me to come back to the spiritual journey it's, it's all about you know the meaning and the quest for meaning and the very meaning of things. So he helped me, him, the one who said God is dead, to understand why for me God is close. And, and then you pursued a, an education in higher Islamic studies. You returned to Egypt. Tell us a little about that and uh, what was the result of that education? How did it add to what you, you've just described? Yes. There is another dimension which is also important is all what I studied in, in French literature because mm -hmm. I was also reading poetry. And it was something which is echoing what I was doing in philosophy. And I was coming, as we said, from a religious family where, you know, it was political exile, but because of religious reasons that they, 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 they left the country. So it was somewhere. And I never rejected completely, but I was not really committed. And when I, I with one, while I was studying, I was dealing with you know solidarity work, and I have a family. I had a family. My mother and my father were pushing me to go towards social justice. I went to South America. I met with Donald de Camara uh, and the liberation theology. This is important. Many people are. I don't know about these experiences at the ground and I went to Africa, I went to India, I met the Dalai Lama. So these were, you know, universes that I was encountering while I was studying philosophy and working for more solidarity and all these sent me back to the sources of my and the meaning of my religion as a Muslim. And I said I, I should do something with that. So I went back to Egypt and I went through a, a whole curriculum but a traditional one. It means one-to-one -one with a, a, a sheikh, with a, a Muslim scholar. He's giving you uh, a teaching, and at the end, he gives you the authority to be able to, to, to teach and to carry on. So I went through all this in, in seven disciplines uh, because for me it was important to, to, to get this, this knowledge and, and, and to have, so to speak, to uh, uh, feet and to be able to, to, to walk. As if I were to summarize this background, it, it seems to be one of, on the one hand, resistance, uh, this uh, liberation theory and, and your background, but on the other hand, a, a kind of a spirituality. And so is, is, is that a fair statement? Or? Once again, it's completely that. It's, it's, it's exactly the way uh, I'm trying to translate this spiritual journey. In fact, uh, it's, yes, it's, uh, um, you know, I, I was studying philosophy, I was studying religion, but I was very much involved in anything which has to do with justice and, and, and human dignity. And, and the people that I met, you know, Christians and Jews and, and Hindus and Buddhists, helped me to be better myself and to, be, to get this sense of uh, uh, dignity and at the same time to, 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 to care for the people around me. And in fact, the two words that you are using are exactly the words that I'm using in French to define the concept of jihad. Jihad, it's very often translated by, you know, holy war, and it's not this at all. Or we come to the literal understanding of jihad, which is uh, effort. No, it's in fact resistance, is you have in yourself uh, bad temptations and, and aggressivity and, and violent, you know, 
attitude you have to master this violence in yourself and to produce an attitude of peace with the bad the good uh, 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 dimension of, of, of who you are with generosity transparency love so this resistance and reform it's exactly this and this is the very meaning of a spiritual journey you you write in in your new book I am Swiss by nationality Egyptian by memory Muslim by religion European by culture universalist universalistic by principle Moroccan and, and Mauritian by adoption so so it's a it's a it's a balancing act is that is that fair yes and I think that uh, it's also to respond to some of the people who are just coming to you and especially these days thank you who are you first tell me your identity and if you say you are Muslim or oh, it means that you are not really an American or you're not an, a Canadian and if you say I am a Canadian the Muslims are going to say oh but you are not a good Muslim if you don't put Islam first I say this is uh, mm -hmm. first it's a very silly question what are you first I am many things so this is what this is the way of putting it is uh, I have there are multiple dimensions uh, to my identity and depending on what I'm doing I'm first a Swiss when I go to vote uh, but I'm first a Muslim when I pray and when I'm facing my own death uh, this is it this we have multiple identities it's it's a response to uh, the people who want very simple answer to silly questions mm -hmm. uh, I uh, in looking at preparing for the interview and, and studying your background uh, I want to touch on the different roles and positions that you've had because you were a, a high school principal uh, an educator you you seem to have been something of an organizer before you became a philosopher and then also a religious scholar uh, and so I, I'm curious and there, maybe there was something else but the issue is how did these different roles inform each other in other words it seems to have been a journey in which you're learning something in these different settings and, and they, 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 they interact with. So I always like to ask my guests, well, what are the skills required for what it is you do? And, and so I, I, I think we can't separate that from the different roles that you've had and, and the way they've informed uh, what you do. Yes, I, I think if I would have liked to, to, to get at that point without having this past and this journey in my life it would have been difficult if because I, that's true that I started as a teacher uh, for me teaching was something which was not a job it was something that I liked you know pedagogy listening helping when I was you know I, I, I got my uh, baccalaureate so so it's uh, the high school uh, very young and I started to to teach while I was just finishing because I wanted uh, to give and, and this is something that I liked and then I was a, a, a teacher in a secondary school and then in a high school uh, so teaching was but all this give me a sense of you know uh, the skills that you need to be able to listen and to go along uh, there is something also that I'm saying in the book I'm recalling a, a story with someone who just you know I wrote a series of, of articles about these students who taught me so much one of them passed away he was 18 and, and because he was it was he, he went through drug addiction and 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 and, and he, Thierry passed away and he sent me this message of you know learn to listen learn to be here don't disappear and teaching is not only transmitting knowledge is going along going along it's to be present so this is one dimension add to this the point that I needed this uh, uh, intellectual uh, uh, culture and intellectual uh, intellectual understanding and this is what why why I went to philosophy and so philosophy to ask the questions religion was the way to get an answer and education was the way to share mm -hmm. and and you 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 know as I went through the the book uh, listening patience non-judgmental 
determination and especially uh, empathy. And you say empathy allows us to understand so then you can be critical and, and reach for change, basically. Yes, because I, I think that, you know, uh, after September 11th, uh, when I came here, you know, I, I condemned what happened. But we were in a stage where people were telling us, you are with us or against us. And if you try to explain uh, what was happening, it's as if you were justifying it. And empathy is exactly this, is to understand without justifying. Say, I understand why this is happening, but I'm, I disagree. I, I can't accept it. And I think that uh, this is the way you are avoiding being too quick, too quickly judgmental, but without avoiding being critical because you need this critical thinking. So I think that empathy and all the, you know, the concepts and, and the attitude, the intellectual and personal attitudes that you are mentioning are for me important. And I would say I spent 25 years of my life in dialogue and, and, and sharing views. And I end up uh, repeating that if you come with an intellectual attitude, which is not based on humility, meaning that you can take from the other, and consistency, meaning you are trying to best to be at, uh, 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 you know, consistent with your own values and respect. You mean that you accept that the other could have other answers than yours. If you don't have respect, consistency, and humility, the dialogue is just exchanging words. Because you're such a cosmopolitan and, and have such a, a, a complex background. Uh, I I'm, I'm want to ask you, what do you see as your primary audience for what you're trying to do now before uh, we go into uh, your mission statement, which is in the book? In other words, are you, are you primarily speaking to second-generation uh, Muslims, or are they just one audience that, that you focus on? No, I think it's just one audience among audiences that I have. No, I'm the main audience. I would say it's human beings, uh, and it could be, uh, you know, I'm just coming back from Africa, uh, talking to, to African people and being able uh, to exchange with them views on, on culture, on roots, on, it has nothing to do with the second generation. Mm -hmm. In fact, all this business about the second generation is coming from French sociology saying, mm -hmm. oh, this is the people who are following. And, you know, patronizing a bit with this, mm -hmm. uh, after four generations, they are still young Muslims. They will never be mature and never, I said, look, they have the same age as me. Uh, and, and, and you are always talking about them as young. And it, it says much more about your way of looking at them. So I would say, no, it's one audience among others. Mm -hmm. but, but, it, but, but because there are so many audiences, it, it really puts you in a uh, <laughs> sort of, uh, uh, you're getting uh, shot at from all directions, metaphorically. Is yes, that... and, 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 and not only this, it, it, you know, uh, I, there is one point which is important, having many audiences, but the same discourse, the, same, mm -hmm. the substance should be the same. Of course, you are going to speak depending on you know, the, the level of you know, the lang language is going to change, the, the, even the, the language itself, you speak Arabic, English, or French, uh, that's fine, but the substance should be the same. And once again, if you are critical towards some of the, the attitudes that you have among Muslims, you are going to be critical, uh, criticized by Muslims. The same with the West. And I'm once again, you know, I was in, in, in the Muslim majority countries and I'm, I'm, I'm just being critical and coming. And I am I'm perceived as problematic because by being critical, it's as if I'm playing the game of the West. But in the West, I'm perceived as too much a Muslim. But the point for me is really this, is to be able within our society to remove the bridges by saying you and me, we are in the same society. So there is no bridges between you and me. There, there are common values and, and this common future in the society. And between the two worlds, so to mm -hmm. speak, between the universe of reference in Islamic majority, Islamic majority countries and, and here, this is where we need more bridges. So this is what I'm trying to do mainly. And, and you say, actually, in the book, you, your mission, uh, that might be my word, but building bridges, explaining Islam, and making it better understood. 
uh, and and it it would seem that uh, the, your philosophy background helps you build the bridges to sort of uh, 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 connect and deconstruct, you know, to to come up with new meanings and new ways of seeing. This is exactly it. I, I think not only it's interesting and important for the Western audience, but all what I have been you know, doing and studying uh, in philosophy. It's also helping me to come back to the very essence of the Islamic concepts and, and to propose new understanding and new definitions for Muslims uh, as well, because very often we repeat the traditional teachings without understanding, you know, for example, oh, Islam is surrender. I say, no, it might be completely different. Is is much more entering in God's peace, because in Islam there is salam and there is something which is a relationship which is getting that peace which is uh, the objective of your life because you are intention so so changing all this you know uh, terminology and getting a better sense of what it could be and at the same time of course uh, to talk to the west and to to, to 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 speak about islam and to translate some of the concepts as i was talking about jihad and other concepts but with time now i'm reaching a point where i realize that there is something that I have to add to this. It's not only explaining Islam. You know, after the, the Pope's controversy, when he spoke in Germany about the roots of Europe, saying they are Greek and, and, and Christian. And, and his argument was that faith and reason they go together, and that's the Western tradition, and, and it was seen as, a, as a, uh, an implicit attack on, on uh, Islam and its contribution to the West. Exactly, or even not acknowledging the fact yeah, that yeah. it happened in history. Uh, so uh, my answer to this is was it might be that Europe does not need a dialogue with the Muslim majority countries and the other, but with itself, not to neglect its own roots. And this was my. And now, as a European, as a Western, I. I have the feeling that it might be that we need to, to work on a new narrative. So the book, The Quest for Meaning, is really to start a process of beyond explaining Islam, let us explain what are the common universal values and, and, and all this discussion that we need to have on tolerance, con education, respect, and all that. And, and my next book would be exactly this, a new narrative, mm -hmm. speaking about our West and our Europe towards a new narrative, which is re constructing something which is without, in fact, neglecting part of this uh, legacy and heritage. Uh, before we talk about that, which w relates to your ideas about universalism, I want to uh, understand your role within the Islamic community. Is it fair to say that you perceive yourself as a reformer, and then what is the work of reform in the Islamic uh, faith? Yes, I, I think first that I'm not representing all the Islamic trends. You know, Islam and the Muslims within the Muslim communities is as complex as Christianity when you speak about Protestant and Christ, uh, Catholic and then within every single uh, tradition you have trends. We have exactly the same. I'm, I'm uh, from the reformist trend, meaning by this that I believe that the Quran is the very word of God. I am a believer and I'm a practicing Muslim. Uh, at the same time, I think that we need to contextualize the text and we have to understand it uh, as a text, an eternal text into history. Uh, there are things that are beyond history. The way we pray, the way we fast is not going to change. But there are other dimensions that we have to connect to, to the historical process in culture and in, uh, uh, in time, in space and time, and, and this has to be done. So. Uh, one of my books is called Radical Reform, Islamic Ethics and Liberation, by saying that it might be by, that by focusing too much on laws, we are forgetting the objectives. And the objectives in contemporary philosophy, but also in the Islamic tradition, are based on applied ethics. What do we want to achieve? And I would say that this is what I want to, 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 to realize from within. I'm working from within the Islamic tradition to promote this understanding that let us get a very deep sense of what do we want to achieve and contribute in the contemporary debates with an Islamic ethics in different fields. So this is why, for example, I completely 
uh, reject the notion of uh, Islamic economy or Islamic finance. I would say there is an Islamic ethics in economy. The c economy is the same for you, it's the same for me, but we are coming with our ethics and this is why we need a debate. Now, as you, as you speak to these different audiences, there, are, there, there is, is the very great possibility that on the one hand, you say things that you later regret or that people attack you for. So, it, you know, one of the, the, uh, the items is your debate with Sarkozy where a question about uh, 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 the stoning of women came up and uh, your answer was seen as less than satisfactory. H help us work through an understanding of what you were trying to say and, and how, as a reformer, you want to move Islam uh, in a direction that uh, uh, brings the insights of the liberal democracy that you're familiar with because of your Western education and training. Um, I think that, once again, it's a very good example to see where I stand in the whole process because, in fact, uh, the President Sarkozy was trying to put me in, in a trap by, by just dragging me in, into, oh, you have to condemn this, uh, speaking about uh, uh, stoning. And my answer, if I would, you know, uh, have, for example, as it was, as it was said, uh, a double discourse, I would have said, oh, I condemn and that's it. No, I, I stayed and remained in what are my principles, that Yes, we have Quranic texts dealing with stoning and corporal punishment and death penalty. I cannot deny this. These are texts. What can we do to, to, to go beyond a literal understanding? And this is exactly what I was saying just before about reformers, is to put things into context, understand the conditions. And then I, I called for a moratorium. The point is that for the last 15 years, I have been calling for this as something which is the essence of my work stop it now and let us have a critical discussion from within. I'm not here to please, you know, uh, Sarkozy or even to win the next election in France. <laughs> it's a pedagogical process and it takes effort and time. And this is what I wanted to do and I still want to do. Recently, last year, we heard with this discussion in Iran about Sakina, uh, the President Sarkozy asking for a moratorium on death penalty. That's fine. This is exactly what I said uh, seven years ago, and now he's coming with the same argument. Because for me, it's uh, really a process within the Muslim-majority countries to be able to help the Muslims, never to betray their principles, but in the light of the objectives, to ask themselves, is it right or wrong what we are doing? One today, in the Muslim-majority countries, you have people who are facing corporal punishment, death penalty, and stoning, because they are poor, because they are in, in, in majority women, and that the whole uh, uh, legal system is corrupt or there is a lack of transparency, I would say, let us be consistent. Yes, the texts are here, but stop it, and the dynamic is coming from within. So this is something which is not always easy, and this is why I'm talking about intellectual empathy. It's to be able to look at the process from where I am in order to move the thoughts, to be critical from within, and not only to please for two minutes an audience which is happy with condemning, not understanding that your own condemnation from the West will have a counter effect on the Muslim majority country. Say, if you condemn, it means that we are going for it. Mm -hmm. So, so in, in a way, because of these multi, mul uh, multiple audiences, you, you, you are arguing that you have to be concerned with moving in the right direction while maintaining your legitimacy as, a, as an authoritative voice within that community. And we, uh, uh, this gets very complicated, so I'm, I'm trying to help our audience understand, you know, that that when you're when you're dealing with these uh, multiplicity of worlds and you you're really working toward reconciliation, this is kind of the problem set that you have to deal with. Yes, it's 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 the the point is really this one, as we said, is is really to be consistent as to the substance. Now, 
you need to, to listen and to look at the people the way they are. Because at the end of the day, if you speak, if, it means that you want to be heard. So try to, try to find a way to be heard by the people that you are uh, talking to. So if I talk to Muslims, I want to be heard. So I have to start with the Islamic references and, and by being clear on the fact that I'm not undermining the whole Islamic system. I say, no, this is, I believe in this. But in the name of my faith, it's important for me to go through this critical process. But it's exactly the same with the West, is that if you want to be heard by Muslims with the West, don't come and lecture the people and pat be patronizing. It's understand where they are and be critical, self-critical is something which is important for all of us. So I would say it's not an easy process, but as we were saying, my own experience, my own life is helping me to be in between this uh, universes of reference and to try to be uh, consistent, clear, and cautious. Because at the end, words matter, and we have to be very cautious with words. Uh, it's, uh, you, you say, let me see if I find the quote in this, uh, in the uh, Quest for Meaning. Uh, you say, uh, well, let, let me read it, one quote, two quotes from you. One is in, in the I Believe book. You say, my aim is to show in theory and practice that one can be both fully Muslim and Western. And beyond our different affiliations, we share many common principles and values through which it is possible to live together within contemporary multicultural societies where various religions coexist. And then in the quest for meaning in your chapter on universalism, you say, the point is not to integrate systems, values, and cultures with other systems, values, and cult customs, but to determine in human terms, in spaces of intersections, where we can meet on equal terms. Mm. So, so that that's your project, yes, really. Exactly. So, so help us understand its meaning, uh, uh, in the sense that there are places where this interface seems contradictory, mm. where the 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 universalism is hard to find. So how, how do we dig for the universalisms that are recognized in both places? I think that the, the, the starting point is really to acknowledge the fact that there are many routes to the same place. The same main place for all of us as human beings is the quest for truth, that what we want is truth and, and answering the question why we are here. But in our societies, we all, you know, you come to the Islamic communities around, around the world. You will see that they talk about justice, equal rights, exactly the same with Christianity, exactly the same with Judaism, exactly with the same with atheists and agnostics. So we have a common word here, but we should acknowledge the fact that there are different truths. So for me, it's not to say there is only one way to be a universalist. Or for example, once I was talking to uh, uh, a journalist, he was saying, oh, the Western universal value. I said, it's a contradiction in term. Western universal values, it means that what is coming from the West is universal, mm -hmm. and what about the others? No, I would say there is only one way. One way to be universal is shared universal. But shared universal means acknowledging the roots uh, that are different. And for the Muslims also to be able uh, to do that. So at one point, it means for every one of us, you can believe whatever you want, but tell me what is the place of the other in your system of belief? Where should they be? Are they acknowledged and respected for who they are? Yes and no. And in our liberal democracies, uh, this is something which is, in fact, the, the fundamental principle. Sometimes we tend to forget that, that it's, you know, uh, it's not here. And there is another point which is in the two quotations that you are uh, uh, making here, which for me is also to be uh, uh, addressed, is the question of power is the question of power. Because if you are in a position of majority and having power, uh, you know, this, the universal uh, belongs to you in a way which is a natural way to speak about it. Uh, and within our society, we speak about equal citizenship. But when you have less economic power, you face 
discriminations. So I wouldn't come with an idealistic, you know, discourse on identity and let us all be together and having, you no, know, in our respective roots, it depends also as to be equal, it depends on, on who you are, what you have, and your status within the society. We, ne we need to deal with power, we need to deal with this power struggle, and there will be no uh, understanding of this justice if we are not speaking about equality in the way we are treated. Uh, my limited understanding of Islam suggests to me that, it, it, that in, in that tradition there was a universalism that uh, uh, empowered it to, to uh, disperse all over the world and be it accepted, but there was an adaptability with the various cultures, a, a kind of uh, uh, interface between whatever the cultural setting was and, 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 and the faith itself. And, and, and I, what, what I want to ask you now about is uh, what do you see as the feelings and thoughts of one situated between the West and the Islamic faith? We've talked about your experience, but you're obviously speaking to audiences in Europe and, you know, both in, in the various vocations you've had. So, so help us, for a Western audience, understand what uh, a Muslim might be experiencing, both in, in feeling and thought in, in this interface. Yes, I, I think it's important to, 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 to understand the trajectory of many of these young generations in the States or in Canada or in Europe. Because the starting point is really this difficulty between religion and culture, which is for the first generation, they came as Moroccan, Pakistani, or, or, or uh, coming from Middle Eastern s uh, societies, and they were experiencing Islam the way it was in the countries of origin. For the second, third, and onward generations is, what is Islamic, and what is coming from the culture of origin? And with this question is, I'm asking the question of the cultures of origin, meaning that at the same time I'm asking the question about the culture within which I live, meaning the American, the Canadian, and, or the Western culture as, uh, as a whole. And this is a very difficult question, because as I'm putting it, you know, religion, there is no religion without culture. There is no culture without religion, but religion is not culture, it's different. So you need to know how you are going to deal with this. And, and this is something which is very difficult because it's within the family. You look at your father, you look at your mother, it's the same religion, but you end up understanding it's not the same culture. It was obvious for me that my father and my mother were Egyptian by culture, but I had another culture. It was the European, and for but I was able to articulate this in, in theory, while the great majority of the Muslims, uh, they just experienced this and, and tried to find their way. So this, uh, uh, it's a very important discussion by telling them, know what are the Islamic principles, and in the name of the Islamic principles, be able to be critical towards your cultures of origin. Not everything which is Arabic or Asian or Pakistani or Turkish is good according to your principles. So you have, why am I saying this? Because very often in the cultures of origin, we have discriminations towards women, it's patriarchal cultures. This is a very deep problem. So, and by doing this, you turn your face towards the new culture in which you live and you take from it. This is the universality of your religion, helping you to navigate between the culture of origin and the new culture and to be able to say, yes, I have no problem being an American by culture, no problem, because I'm taking from this culture. I'm experiencing this critical attitude, which is whatever is good is mine. And uh, I think that what you're suggesting in the book is that it, 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 in, the, in the context of these tensions, there is a, a, a search for identity. There is a lot of anxiety, and you really feel that instilling self-confidence uh, is, is very important for navigating this dynamic. Yes, this is, you know, we are talking about very, you know, theoretical discussion about this, but at the end of the day, 
really what I'm, I'm experiencing by talking to Muslims in the West. And by the way, not only in the West, I, I would say just uh, in Africa it's the same, is there is a crisis of identity. It's, it's something which is a lack of confidence. The image of Islam today around the world is quite negative. So there is a pressure. So the Muslims are on the defensive. It's as if they don't have the skills or they don't have the, the means to, uh, uh, to go beyond all, uh, overcome the whole, the, whole, the whole process. So you need to give them this sense of confidence and to be assertive. This is your rights, this is your dignity, be who you want to be. And, and in the process of, the, in the book, I'm talking about seven C's that are so important for the Muslims to get the first one is confidence. Is, and, and it's not arrogance, it's confidence, is know who you are and be, uh, uh, and be knowledgeable about your principles and try to find your way in this world. Now, uh, let, let's take one final case. We're, we're running out of time, but uh, bringing all together, you described about yourself. You recently on the mosque controversy took the position. Uh, tell us about your position on the mosque controversy and, and what you had to say in the Washington Post. Yes, it, it surprised many, many uh, Americans and many Muslims at the same time. Because uh, my position is this one, there are rights in this country and you should not give up our rights in the States as well as in, the Muslim, in, the, in, in other European countries. Now you have to look at the whole uh, the picture uh, from an angle of your rights, but the collective sensitivity and the priorities. You know, uh, uh, some people are telling me, oh, is it right then? Would it be, would have it be right for Rosa Parks, for example, when she was in the bus uh, as an African-American uh, to move from the seat because she was black, as now we are asked to move the mask? Mm -hmm. Because this was what I was saying, if possible, remove it or move it from there. But my position here is not only to speak about where she was sitting, it's to speak about the whole bus and who is driving the bus, who is creating this, all this fuss against this. So my position is there are more than 20 mosques in this country that are prevented from being built because people are saying, oh, the mosque. I would say we are not going to give up. This is America and this is freedom of conscience and freedom of religion. Now for this, for what is happening here? In New York City. In New York, York City, City, the community center. I would say I can understand that there is a sensitivity that they are victims and they are saying, it's right, it's your right, but sometimes you have to think about the way you use your rights. This is decency. So I'm not saying you give up our rights. We may find other solutions. I had people saying, oh, we may go for an Abrahamic center. Or, but I don't have a problem to, to say on that. I get a sense of the collective sensitivity. I'm not going to put all my energy on this because I think that there are other uh, 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 struggles that we have to 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 uh, uh, to be in, in, in indulging in and, and, and to understand. So the people just took one sentence. Oh, he's saying remove the center. I'm not only saying this. Is don't lose confidence, struggle for your rights, and sometimes know that you should not be obsessed with rights. You should also take into account the collective psychology and to come with a comprehensive approach. And I think that this is what I have been saying in Europe and in the States and in Canada for years. Uh, even just to go quite quickly on this, when we got this uh, uh, controversy on, on the, the cartoons mm -hmm. and the people are saying, it's my rights to, yes, it's your rights. It's not always, it's silly, but it's your rights. I'm not going to tell you don't do it. And I, to, I, I, told, I, I said to the Muslims, take a critical distance. Don't react too much to this and say, we don't like it and do it. So sometimes this obsession with my rights, uh, without having a vision, an, a, a, a comprehensive vision of the whole discussion may be problematic. So my position is the Muslims have the right to build this community center in New York. I, I'm not sure that they have to go for it the way it is. They may think about something, an alternative, acknowledging the symbol of this place, but at the same time saying to all the Americans, if this is because of the symbol, there are other symbols in which you have to be with us by saying we can't accept that a mosque cannot be built in this country because of some people creating and instrumentalizing fear 
uh, in this country. And I think that these people are very dangerous, not only for Muslims, they are dangerous for the future of America. Uh, many of the students who might watch this video probably have similar backgrounds, uh, whether they're uh, Muslims, but they might be, you know, second generation and so on. What, what do you think are the lessons of your life as we have discussed it uh, uh, that would relate to their preparation for their own futures? You know, I, I, this, this is a, I, I got the response to this question by many uh, young and not so young Muslims coming to me and say, I just find myself in what you were, you were saying because it's the same experience. So the first is really uh, there is no uh, contradiction but being both, as you quoted, the, the, this is something which is you can be both. The second is really a question of confidence, as we said, and the third one is a question of knowledge. It's really a knowledge. And then there is a last point for me which is important, which is uh, I'm always saying to the Muslims, try to normalize your presence without trivializing it. So you should contribute. You should be someone who is giving something to his or her society in one way or another, not only in sports, not only in culture or in entertainment, in all the fields, solidarity, environment, uh, uh, justice, schools, education. So I would say that uh, if anything, coming out of what I have been trying to do is critical thinking, deep faith, accepting this journey, but contribution. And contribution is exactly what you translated by saying you have many audiences and you are trying to share this view with many people. So I get that understanding by many young Muslim men and women uh, telling me this is, this is what we, 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 we are getting from your experience. And that's true. This is what I want them to understand. One of the things that stands out uh, as one reads uh, some of your books and your background is uh, the enormous self-confidence you have in moving between these two worlds. W what do you see as the source of that? Was it your family, your religion, your education, or all of them? All of them. I think it's my life. It's really that uh, I was going from one you know, environment to the other and always. I, I learned to listen a lot. I learned to listen a lot, maybe because I was the youngest. So I listened <laughs> to the eldest. And, and really, I was listening a lot and, and this listening and, and being able to listen and to go from one universe of reference to the other uh, helped me uh, a great deal. And, and, and I would say that uh, at the end of the day, if you want to communicate, start by uh, listening to the people around you. Well, on that note, uh, Tariq, I want to show your book again to our audience. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good read, and it's very lucid in, in helping uh, us understand uh, what you're trying to do, both in your, uh, your advocacy and in your writings. And thank you uh, very much uh, for joining us, and thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history. Thank you.